to start with, and so as the lawyer for the gym, I wouldn't explain to you much about this process. That's your right. lawyer's job to do it, but I'll do that today just so that people watching this kind of understand. So in, in the US, you might see on TV uh, what they call a deposition. They videotape the person. We don't do that in Canada. It's just a, a court reporter. It's a room similar to this, although I will say that generally the lawyer sits across the table, not on the same side, but just for video purposes, we're sitting on the same side today. Um, a, a, a court reporter transcribes everything. That turns into a transcript that then can be used at court. Uh, that can be used for a couple of reasons. One, to impeach or show the other person's lying, or you can just use that transcript as evidence. So if something really good happens in the transcript, and like for example, in this case, as a lawyer for the gym, let's say you say something that's really good for our case. I can just take that transcript, introduce that in what's called read-ins in court, and that's evidence. And the transcript is like a little binder of pages with a, that has all the words written on it. Exactly. That during yeah. The yeah. It's got every word. It's got every page. It's got it's got uh, all the uh, requests that go through examination for discoveries, and that's something you you have to bring to court. You have to bring the original, um, and then you just keep copies and, and kind of use that throughout the process. But so it's quite important. Um, it can change cases quite easily. So that's kind of what we're going to do today. We're going to deal with kind of a couple mock questions in an examination for discovery, how that would look, how um, what might look good isn't necessarily good, and how sometimes what looks boring or innocuous is actually quite good for your case. And it can change cases because it's all sworn evidence, so you can't really go back on what you said during the examination. Or can you during the trial and say it wasn't quite true? Or like you how know, you come back from that? It's very difficult. It's under oath. So you promise to tell the truth. The court system works under this process. So judges don't like when you say in one scenario, I told, I promised to tell the truth. I understood I was telling the truth. And then you change that later. That really affects your credibility. So you can imagine a judge often in wrongful dismissal cases has to decide, there's usually more than one story uh, or, or one version of the story. And the judge has to decide, who do I believe? And the judge takes a lot of factors into account. One of them is, the witness's credibility. So if, if at trial in six months or a year, you're saying X and in examination for discovery, you said Y, the judge has to go, well, this person under oath, can I believe them? So it's huge. Now, that being said, um, you can maybe explain it. You know, sometimes um, you say something a certain way and you mean it in your head a certain right. way, but that's not how it comes out. And so that's why it's very important to, and we talked about this before, take your time on questions. Right. And that's kind of the examples we're gonna be going through today, which is one's a good one of all the things you and I've talked about before, and one's a bad one of that I would suggest is kind of more natural for people. And that's why you need to prepare with your lawyer before you do your examination for discovery. Because it's kind of, as you suggest, it's kind of written in stone after that. That's evidence. Very important. What would you say the biggest difference between examination for discovery or deposition, as it's sometimes called, and testifying in trial is in terms of how you're asked questions and how you're supposed to prepare for that? Or is it basically the same minus the fact that the judge can hear objections? Yeah. So the examination for discovery process is just that. It's so the other party gets to discover what your evidence will be at trial. So they ask a lot more varied questions because the other thing about the transcript, so today I'm examining you as the employer, you can't use this transcript. Right. So it doesn't really matter what you say, you can't make your case better. You can right. only make your case worse. Right. And I get to know as the employer, the lawyer for the employer, I get to understand what I should expect to hear at trial if I ask good questions and you give the evidence. That's the discovery process. It's one factor of it. So that being said, the biggest difference is there's no judge there, right? right? The second biggest difference is I can kind of ask questions that I'm not scared of the answer. So one of the things they teach you as a junior lawyer, never ask a question of a witness you don't know the answer to. Right. So I can do that in examination. It doesn't. If you, if you give me a horrible answer, I'm like, okay, I'm not using that, but you can't use it and your right. lawyer can't. So it's no big deal. At trial, if I don't know an answer, you know, it's very risky because it could really hurt our trial. So that's probably the biggest difference is um, the judge isn't there for object objections. So if your lawyer's not there, if you don't have a lawyer, then no one's going to object to a question. You have to answer those questions. If your lawyer doesn't object because whatever reason, you answer that question, now it's evidence. So, um, I think the, the, the biggest difference is it, this can be a lot of 
varied questions and, and objections. We'll talk about that some other time. We've talked about that before, but basically you can ask any question you want that's relevant without objection. And at trial, you keep it very focused. And, um, you know, it's also a bit more cross-examine. Uh, you, you, you ask questions, I think, against an opposing witness, very much an examination, or sorry, a cross-examination style. In, in examination for discovery, what we're gonna do today, I might just ask you, so tell me a bit about this. I would never ask that question right. at trial. I would, don't know where I'm gonna go with Yeah, answer. so my questions at trial would be like, isn't it true you did this? Isn't it true this happened? Right. Isn't it true? And so they're very much keeping you very narrow right. because if I've done my job correctly in examination for discovery, I already know what your answer is gonna right. be. And so a good example might be, you give an exam, a question, an answer in examination for discovery, so I now know what that question is. It's under oath and it's in transcript. I'll ask you that same question because it's a good one at trial. And if you change that, I'd be like, well, but you know, pull out the transcript, out the transcript and right. say, didn't, didn't six months ago, I asked you the same question. You said something different. Right. I might say, which is it? And then, wow, you've got some credibility problems, right? right? So, so uh, that's probably the biggest difference. And I, on, honestly, it's, you know, uh, it's a lot more, I think it's a lot more intimidating to go in front of a judge in open court. Like, right, we're doing this examination for discovery, like I said, it's exactly kind of the way it is. It's in a closed room. It's me, you, your lawyer, my client sometimes, and a reporter, and that's it. And a lot of people are doing these on Zoom nowadays, which is not my favorite thing, but, so it's the, the in some ways the stress level is quite a bit less. Than in trial. I mean, in at least trial. the judge is there to, you know, if the questions are getting out of control and the lawyer is being argumentative, the judge can protect you versus 100%. an examination yes. where it's kind of the Wild West. Yes, and some judges will and some judges won't. Right. But if you've never given testimony in trial, it's just stressful. You know, it's, it's kind of like public speaking where something, where it really matters. Right. You know, you can't just... Yeah. You know, it's you, it could be your whole case is dependent on it. So, um, you know, you want to do your preparation for that, too. And so I think those are things that people don't really think about, but that is different. It's very different. Yeah. So those are probably the biggest differences. So why should I actually answer questions during examination for discovery if I can't use any of my good answers? Why shouldn't I just keep the answers extremely short and just like, yes, no, not sure? Uh, why should I even, you know, offer multi-sentence answers to any of the questions if I can't use it. You shouldn't. You should keep your answers very succinct. You know, and what we talked about before is that you should really think about your answers and you should really engage in this process and you should be, you know, it's too important to kind of just get through. You have to really be prepared. Um, we've talked a bit about what that looks like before. That preparation is going through the documents and going through examinations, or sorry, affidavits, if you've done that before. Um, but yeah, you shouldn't, um, you know, when I do examinations, if the witness goes on and on and on, that's great. You know, it's like, that's great things. It's great in some ways to use against them potentially later. Um, I had examination last week where the person told me quite a few things about themselves that was not really necessarily directly relevant, but it was so relevant when I was questioning them about their knowledge and how could they make this decision in light of, it was a real estate related matter, in light of their experience in real estate, you know, so that was very helpful to me that they were so open about these things. Now, you do have, you have to answer questions. If your lawyer doesn't object, you have to answer them. That's how the process works. In theory, if you didn't and you're unreasonable, the lawyer could take that transcript to um, court in an application and get your whole case dismissed. Is, have you ever actually seen that happen before? No, people normally do. Right. They, they, they understand the process. They understand the importance of the process. Um, they um, answer the questions to the best of their ability and uh, if they were properly prepared succinctly. Right. Right. I remember being in court and someone refused to, it was some other matter that was being heard before ours, mm -hmm. and someone refused to actually attend an examination for discovery. They were in Calgary and the case was in Vancouver and they didn't want to fly out to Vancouver to do the examination for discovery. And it was before COVID, so I guess there was no Zoom yeah. um, you know, examinations. And the judge just dismissed the entire case based on... Against them. Yeah, against yeah them. you have to participate. There's a lot of things you have to do. There's a lot of rules, and you have to follow those rules. And um, if you have a lawyer, generally lawyers will direct you not to be silly like that right. and waste time and efforts. But that's great. Uh, it's good to hear that the courts do that. That just, you know, If you're not... Especially if you started the lawsuit... 
And you're, you know, you right. know, some people always do that. They're like, well, I don't want to do this and don't do that. Well, then you started the lawsuit, yeah, yeah. you know, like you're now participating. Right. You have to participate. And courts, if they're not, if they get bothered by your conduct, will award costs. And we can talk about that another time. But that's, that's where the courts say, look, your actions or, or inactions in some cases make it so that you should have to pay costs to assist the other side and the expenses they've had to right. Legal put fees and... Disbursements, disbursements and stuff, yeah, and yeah, court fees, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, so that's often what the courts will award to to keep people from doing these uh, doing silly or improper things.